Socrates is guilty of not believing in the city's gods or not believing in any god. Like, like he's like, I doubt that he's not an atheist because like we know that atheist is when someone doesn't believe in God. But as for Socrates, he doesn't believe in the gods of the state, but he believe in like other divinities of his own. So that's still like something holy and God-like figure. And so he's not an atheist. Oh, so he's still someone who believes in God. And for me, I would consider myself like Socrates and we are not atheists because although I don't believe in like Allah or Jesus, I pray to higher spirits like from time to time to just for like calm, like calming me down for protection or just for reassurance when I'm scared. And I pray to like, I pray that like my good deeds will pay me back during bad times and that ancestors will look after me. And I think like in a way that's very similar to Socrates. And so I don't consider myself an atheist, neither would I consider Socrates as one. So yeah. Do you want to repeat what you said about corrupting the youth? Because I hadn't turned on the recording. So since a okay. few people are here, um, so the rest of you that are here, the reason Rossi is speaking is that she has to go get a COVID test uh, any minute now because her village has been just diagnosed, uh, delegated or uh, labeled a red zone. <laughs> so there's like 70 people in the market out of a hundred that, that were tested positive. So she has to go, but we might as well hear her say, uh, did Socrates corrupt the youth? And then she goes. Um, when questioning about Socrates corrupting the youth or not, we need to define what type of corruption we are talking about. If you mean that corruption is teaching youth to not acknowledge the gods which the state acknowledges, then Socrates did corrupt the youth that way. However, my definition of corruption is different as I believe that corruption is brainwashing someone from doing good deeds to evil acts that are unlawful and unfaithful. However, what Socrates does is giving a chance for youth to think for themselves and not blindly follow their leaders. And Socrates gives these people a chance to explore their options and learn to be independent. And it's an important uh, life skill. So I think that's not uh, corrupting the youth. Okay, so we've got to let Rossi go. Okay, thank you, Dr. Beck, goodbye. Okay, good luck and you keep us posted about Thank whether you. you have corona and how your village is doing and all those things. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yes. Take care. Okay, there's Liam. Nine o'clock. Okay. Is everybody ready to clock in oh, on whether Socrates corrupted the youth and whether he's an atheist? That's what you have to decide. Okay, so Aiden, did it come across any differently this time? Did any different things come to mind? Not really, no. Um, I'd say just because last time, my opinion, I guess, already changed from what I was doing before. So if anything, I think it's more solid in that you didn't corrupt the youth. Okay. Um, so every time I read it, of course, there's a different cultural context um, when I read, you know, when I'm teaching at Lyon versus when I'm teaching at AUW, <laughs> I mean, it's just, uh, it's very interesting. There's similarities. You just have different examples, right? The students come with different life experiences and examples, but they still understand the same questions. So it's kind of nice to under, it just gives you a, a much easier way of telling what is it that's true for everybody? And what is it that's different? Um, so, 
Uh, people are slow to come, I think. Or I guess maybe I'm, I guess I'm over eager here. Um, Thomas, Thomas is with me. He's still trying to get in through his phone. Okay. Um, uh, hi. <laughs> okay. Who, who was that other person? Uh, Thomas Osborne. Oh, Thomas, yes. Okay. There he is, the tree hugger. Um, well, I don't know, as long as we're waiting, does anybody want to like throw out the first view of whether Socrates corrupts the youth and whether he's an atheist? Anybody want to throw some raw meat to the dogs here? Yeah, let me do this. I'm great at giving terrible topics for debate. Um, I'm gonna make mine really short, because super simple. Obviously he was corrupting the youth. He was educating them and educated people are very difficult to manipulate. So he was ruining the power structures. Uh, he was probably not, he was, he, was, he was maybe not fully atheistic, but I, I, I like to think he would be just, you know, conforming to any social norms he had to. And um, uh, I'm going to circle back to the corrupting the youth thing, because my man was an educator. He was doing everything he needed to do. I'm very proud of him. Who's, who, Socrates? Yes. Oh. <laughs> All right. Actually, at least you sort of know the definition of an educator as opposed to a professor, right? The word educate means to educe. So all he does is ask people questions. This is really important because people always are saying, well, his teachings. He doesn't have any teachings, right? All he does is ask people what they think and then he follows up on it. And does that everybody understand that? Because people read it and they say, well, he has these students and he's teaching them. No, he's not, <laughs> he's not, right? Um, and so I hope you understand, right? When I say, that you read the stuff and you tell me your three reactions, some students just freak out. Like they don't have any idea what they're supposed to do. Right? And it just takes a different part of your brain to realize, oh, you wanna know what I think? Yeah, I wanna know what you think because I want, I want you to know what you think, right? And that's what he's doing. He's trying to help students understand what they think. Um, so anyway, um, that's kind of where we're starting. Um, I remember I had had a number of professors in college who professed all this stuff and I really didn't like it. And then I had a Socratic educator and that was, that was different. Um, anybody else want to just say something while we're still giving people a couple more minutes? I can chime in on the atheist aspect of the conversation. Liam said he, you know, imagined Socrates as an atheist, but I think from reading some of um, Socrates' work, I really don't think he was an atheist. I mean, at least by my definition of atheism, which is a lack of, you know, any divine power. He clearly believed in some higher being. I don't think he prescribed to you know the typical religion of the time but i do think that there was some sort of divine being and afterlife in his um religious structure do you remember at the end he says um you don't know if there's an afterlife or not right mm -hmm. to think you know is to think you know what you don't know does that make sense and the whole point is that isn't anything to do with your motivation for what you're doing. Does that 
Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Because why do people bother either rejecting it or accepting it? What is their agenda? <laughs> if you completely leave it alone, you don't have any, you have to completely not be motivated by that at all. Um, does that make sense to you, Alexis? Yeah, it does. Did it in some of his other works, though. He was, um, or I guess from Plato's opinion, he did concretely said that he believed that there was some sort of afterlife. I think I believe yeah. something like that. There's a daimon that, that, and he said, you know, the daimon hasn't been telling me not that I'm doing anything wrong, right? So think about this. The daimon only tells him what's wrong. You know, when he, when he, the daimon will tell him not to do something. Don't you guys have a little voice inside of your head that just says, uh, really, I don't think so. I don't think you should do that. And then the question is, is that a God or is that your mind? <laughs> right? Is that just, and that is a question. Is that your own mind? Your own idea of the good? Or is it um, some supernatural being come in there or, or what, right? Does that make sense to you, Alexis? Yeah, I get what you're saying. Okay, so I think y'all should break into groups for starters. And then after that, you know, I'll talk some. Or first of all, somebody has to be kind of the monitor or leader or something and make sure everybody in the group talks and take notes or whatever be prepared to report in to the big group and then um, make sure everybody speaks so I hope by this point in the class uh, nobody says I don't know what we're supposed to do I don't know what she wants don't think like that just, did you read it? What did you think while you were reading it? If you, if you didn't even read anything before class, just listen. Listen to what the other students say and ask them a question, right? Just like Socrates. Just listen and ask a question. So everybody should uh, contribute to the conversation. Does everybody get that? Does that make sense? Um, you're just coming to understand your own mind. Um, all right, so I'm gonna put you in these groups and you come, when you run out of things to say, and it might be 10 minutes, it might be 15 minutes, it'll fit 15 max, but if you really are done, um, Honestly, come back and contact me about it because I don't want to waste class time uh, just sitting there. That is a complete waste of time. Um, okay, so everybody that has a meeting in 10 minutes needs to- It should just be the, the white side people. Okay, so how come they didn't come back? I called them back. Um, so go ahead. Do your, okay. do your minutes and then everybody else. I don't know. It's a breakout room. It's closed in 30 seconds. So, can I go ahead and go? Go ahead, Thomas. Okay. So, first, when thinking about what makes up a good citizen, I think that's the golden age of Athens really highlighted what it took. It took communication between citizens it's a involvement and wait information. wait there's too much background noise there what's going oh on? yeah i'm very sorry we are all in the same room because we're about to go to that meeting i can actually move out of this if we just give me one second yeah i can move out of this okay so there's some people that have a meeting in 10 minutes so let them talk and then we'll let them go and maybe the rest of us will be able maybe there'll be few enough of us okay go ahead who else besides Thomas has a meeting at Whiteside? Liam, Blaine, and I. Yeah, all the us four. Me, Blaine, Liam, and I. Uh, four of you. Okay. So 
can all of you just say your say and then go to the meeting? Okay. So two of you already have kind of. Go ahead, Thomas. Okay. So when I was reading through what Socrates said, I really think that what highlighted a good citizen is someone, and he compared himself to a gadfly on a lazy horse. And I feel like every citizen should be that gadfly. They need to be always buzzing around, always settling down when things start getting content and then to raise questions, raise debate. And part of being able to do that means being informed and being responsible about keeping yourself and others informed. And you could see that like Athens, they had the marketplace where citizens could go to really communicate and find out what issues were coming up. And um, I, I just believe that Socrates wasn't corrupting the youth because like you said, he was an educator. He was merely making them ask questions, making them discover what they thought as opposed to kind of programming them to what he thought. Um, I also believe that Socrates probably wasn't an atheist. I don't believe he was, at least not a full atheist. I think he was just questioning, which is kind of his whole thing. Um, I think one proof of him just not being a full atheist is the fact that he took what the uh, prophet at Delphi said quite literally. He uh, believed that he wasn't the wisest man because he was, he was the wisest man because he knew that he wasn't. He knew that he didn't know everything. All the, all the Oracle said was no one is wiser than Socrates. It didn't yeah. say he was wise. Yeah. I, I really think that he definitely at least believed in some form of a higher power because he had to, if he believed that someone was wiser than him. I believe that if knowledge exists, someone has to know it. Someone has to be capable of understanding it. And he knew that he didn't understand that. But that's really all I got out of it. I'd be happy to email you what I wrote down um, if you need me to. Well, that post, you know, that's mm -hmm. your, yeah. your annual, your weekly post. Okay. okay. All right, Thomas. How about Blaine? Okay. Um, hi. Um, so, yeah, I, I, partially agree with both Liam and Thomas. Um, I think that from Socrates' perspective, he thought that he was a good citizen. He like he tried to be productive and active in the society. Like he he cared about people and like that's what I define as a good citizen, someone who helps out in the community and like participates and is productive. Um, and I think I'm partially disagreeing with them in that I don't think that he corrected the youth exposing people to ideas i don't think corrupts them it's the leading like like this is the way that's the corruption not the exposing them to their like to new ideas and like he was showing them how to think for themselves and how to come up with their own ideas and i don't think that that's i don't think that that corrupts them also, i also think hmm? he also made them accountable for their ideas too yes and i i think that you know, that's that doesn't feel like corruption to me. Um, I don't, don't think that he was an atheist. Um, I mean, he he followed the the prophet of Delphi very precisely, even though the, I mean the the prophet wasn't like was very vague, as you said. But um, to believe in a prophecy, I feel like you have to believe in something, some higher power. If it's gods or God, who knows um but yeah i think that's yeah. so one thing about religion you know his daimon told him what not to do isn't that a major value in every religion to be humble and not to be arrogant i yes i agree with that but i right. think that's also just uh like a human thing as well you want to be <laughs> kind you want to be humble but i yes and the, the, the daemon, I mean, I feel like that's probably a, a part of a religion. So that also proves that he wasn't an atheist. Okay. But it is interesting that a secular person could value that same thing, right? And think that people, yes. people thinking they know what they don't know mm -hmm. is what destroys societies, right? Pride. Yeah. You can say that without believing in any sort of God. Yeah. Um, but... Okay, so um, so do you, you guys have to go or what time is this meeting start 9.30? Okay, 
Um, does, do any of the four of you want to say anything else? And then the other people can start drilling you <laughs> before you go. Somebody else ask these people, don't let them get out alive here. Yes, please lay into it. It'll be very fun. Ask all the questions. Oh, come on. Aiden, ask something. Why um, does he call it the apology? Oh, very good. I, I want to say sarcasm. Socrates, above all else, was an honorary. I don't know if that word is appropriate for a classroom, but he is, he is certainly a guy that enjoys irony, whether it be dramatic or otherwise. So I think that it's called the apology because it is an apology for him being so unapologetically himself. Well, look, it's, it's named like a Greek tragedy, right? Every single one of them, it's reversal, right? Reversal and recognition. So Agamemnon, he's the guy with the flaw, right? So he appears, he thinks he's the most powerful guy. Actually, he made this huge mistake, right? And so Euthyphro, right? That's also named ironically. So that actually, you know, don't you ever study the Beatitudes? Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. I mean, every religion tells you this is what the world, this is how it appears to be. And the reality is the opposite, right? So when he says apology, like it appears, but it's not really. It's really an affirmation of what it means to be a human being. Does that make sense? And it, it's not arrogant. I mean, so many scholars think. But if they had just grown up with religious literature, they would know that all of it is, here's the physical world. Here's the spiritual world, right? It's the opposite. Does that make sense to you, Liam? Um, the, the, your point about growing up with religious texts and the separation between uh, the physical and spiritual world, that went right over my head, I think. <laughs> okay. Well, people, it appears that all anybody cares about is sex, money, power, and the fear of death right? But the reality is we should care about wisdom, uh, justice, and truth. And that actually that's being really human, is to care about that. Okay, that, that put, pulls it together, yeah. Okay, so it's really an affirmation of life. It's not an apology. <laughs> Does that make sense? But it's not mocking people out. It's not sarcasm. It's not tricky ricky kind of stuff it's just standard you have to learn to look beyond appearances right that's it okay somebody else nobody i have a question for all of you guys Good. do you think this apology speaks deeper to what was going on in athens at the time I mean, I think it speaks to what's like always been going on in like most, you know, political spheres. This was an attempt from the people at power to, you know, stop the corruption or the education of the youth. So their, you know, line of power wouldn't be interrupted. So, I mean, this cycle is like continuously go on what the apology and the defense is, you know, meaning. Very good, good question. Come on, I'm going to start picking you out and making you ask a question. Um, so how about somebody from AUW? <laughs> Nimra, go ahead. Based on your experience. Is she there? Um, Nahida, do you have a question? Uh, 
no professor uh, but uh, i am really uh, surprised to hear his uh, wisdom actually he was dramatically expressing his opinion while he was saying uh, uh, he was accused uh, to be a teacher but he was saying although if a man is able to teach i honor him for being paid actually every uh, every defensive word i liked uh, very, and uh, he was also saying that uh, people of athens are hardly speaking true but he was nearly getting persuaded i like his dramatical point okay good um uh giovanni do you have something to say no i'm just listening and learning are, are there any connections between this and your own country no not not this part no but when there is something i'll let you know okay um what about shahans shanaz yes professor i don't have any question i'm just listening did you have a reaction when you read it um not really not really okay well okay haley have you got something um, I didn't necessarily think he was corrupting the youth. I think he was just opening up their minds. And um, I related that back to like Jesus, um, his followers saw something different in him than the religious leaders, like Socrates, his followers saw something different. Yeah, he had trouble with the mega church guys and the fundamentalists, right? Jesus. <laughs> Well, you know, not believing in the city's gods is basically the fundamentalists. Um, and they were also the powerful leaders. <laughs> um, so what about, let's see, Destiny? Are you asking what I think or if I have questions? Either one. Um, I think that you have to define uh, corruption first. Okay. Um, so you have to um, look at who's actually asking the question, which is the people in power who are suing him. Um, so from their perspective, he's definitely corrupting the youth. He's um, changing their opinions, making them actually think about uh, what they've been told and what they've assumed. But from a greater perspective, um, I don't really think it's possible to corrupt someone without lying to them in some way. And he's really not telling them anything. He's just making them ask their own questions by asking them uh, very pointed questions. Um, so I don't think he's corrupting anyone, but the people in power, like, if, if the question becomes, has he done what he's accused of, then the answer is yes. Is it his fault though, or is it, right? So he's, he's asking, he's forcing, he's exposing people who are given authority over something. So here's corruption. So you claim to be an expert, right? You're given, the public is trusting you to exercise a certain kind of authority, right? It could be medical. It's not just political, medical, education, legal, anything. And you're taking that advantage you have, people need you for this, and you're using it for your own purposes to get more money, more power, help your friends and harm your enemies, instead of for the well being of the people who need your expertise. And so he's asking them to, to tell, what is it you know that justifies your position in society, right? So that's transparency. And then follow-up questions are accountability, right? So um, you, you can say, this is what I think I know, but then accountability is that you have to show me that you really do know this or you're applying it correctly. So can you have a democracy if the citizens don't 
demand transparency and accountability from people in power. Yeah, he was definitely functioning within um, the reasonable limits of democracy, but um, people with power don't ever really want to let it go. So it's, they didn't really care um, whether he was being reasonable or fair or not. It was more that he was threatening them and that was the real accusation. So the truth is they lost their democracy spiritually, right? People didn't, they weren't willing to have the kind of psychological condition that you have to have to maintain a democracy, which is intellectual honesty, fairness to um, opposing points of view, patience with complexity and ambiguity. Does everybody understand that? Right, it's right in the lion mission statement. And this is what Socrates does, I think. Uh, I don't even think the people who wrote it know that, to tell you the truth. <laughs> but just to understand in your own mind that you have to stay uncomfortable if you want to preserve democracy. Does that make sense? And you have to be willing to question yourself, right? He says you have to examine yourself as well as each other. Are you sure about that? Um, and the polarization in our country right now, right? Polarization means everybody thinks they know what they, you know, thinks they know. And then they won't talk to other people. And that that is exactly a huge problem, right? For our democracy. And that's that's exactly what was happening in Athens. And Socrates just wasn't a polarizing figure in what he's doing. But of course, he was made into this incredible polarizing figure by people who had a political interest in making him into that. Does that make sense to people? Um, yeah. But anyway, okay. it, yeah, go ahead. So um, I have a question. Actually, how his religious views and wisdoms are interrelated? Can you guys explain it? How are his views of what? Religious views and wisdoms are interrelated. Okay, religious views and wisdom? Yes. Good, very good question. How they're related? Okay, so go for it, guys. Very good question. Well, what is wisdom? They're related in the sense that his religious views aren't like permanent. He doesn't like read the Bible and see it as law. He He's able to like, I guess I'd say go around what is written in it. Um, and I think that just brings him wisdom because he knows that not everything you see or read has to be a certain way. Like there are, um, I guess, what's the word? Um, just there's times that you don't have to follow and read exactly what you hear. And that makes more wise. Okay. Would you say wisdom means sort of knowing what's best in the circumstances and being willing to adjust? Did you take off your earphones, Aiden? Did you hear that? No. Okay. So again, I don't know how many of you, you know, if you, how, I don't remember when I was your age, what I was thinking, because the older you get, of course, the more you do have to adjust constantly because things are changing constantly. But um, have you ever thought that in order to really think through something, you have to be able to give up some fixated belief that you had and just let it go, re-examine it. And have you ever talked to yourself this way that you, you say, this is what I really think. And now just for a thought experiment, think exactly the opposite just to see if the opposite view makes any sense. 
Does any, have any of you tried to do that just to sort of test yourself? I used to have to do that all the time when I was in high school for debate. We have, you didn't have a choice on necessarily which side you were on. And so you'd have to write cases from both sides. Doesn't matter what your perspective was. And so you would get into really in-depth topics, whether it be criminal justice reform or um, arm sale policies. And you'd have to remove your own kind of conscious bias to be able to write from both sides to give it to, so you'd even have a shot to win. But I think it was even Socrates, it was either Socrates or Aristotle who said it was like the mind of an educated thinker is to be able to basically think through an idea without believing it. And I think that's one of those kind of quotes that have stuck with me for a very long period of time is that you have to be able to entertain different ideas and different thought processes to really kind of figure out where you stand amongst what you're being told. Isn't that what is going on in the Euthyphro dialogue? Is yeah. that it's showing you various issues that come up among religious believers and you're just putting them, condensing them into one conversation with one guy, but they brought up all these issues that everybody, you know, that just keep coming up. Does that make sense, Samantha? Yes. And that's one thing I found, I think, especially fascinating about the apology, the whole idea about the corruption of the youth. And I think where, I guess it depends on what point of view you stand from, but as multiple other students have said, from people in power, I really wonder if they really did consider himself, him corrupting the youth or him taking away their power in a sense that <laughs> he was just asking questions. He was just getting people to think more critically and that he wasn't, as many, many people said, wasn't leading people to believe a certain way. So I wonder if those people truly saw it as corruption themselves or just saw it as a threat more to them and use the excuse of corruption to kind of tr try to track him. Cynical, right? Yeah. Well, does anybody have an opinion about that? Do you think Meletus, right? The guy that accused them of being an absolute atheist. Do you think Meletus really believed that? Yeah, very good. You're right, Nahida. <laughs> good for you. Actually, you guys, we could do thumbs ups emojis. Um, I prefer just to go like this. Okay. Uh, but I now I'm going to call on each one of you individually and ask you to say something. So I know that like, you're you didn't leave the room. <laughs> partly, but really try each of you try to think of something to say or a question to ask just so you're engaged, okay? Promise me you're gonna indicate that you're engaged. Uh, uh, I had a question. Good. So, so you see how like the, the like, how you say like the dictionary, I don't wanna say, I don't wanna say dictionary, but like the, the definition of atheist is like not believing in like God or God's right? But does that go for like, if, let's say someone believes in one god but they they don't believe like another one exists would you still consider them or just the fact that they believe in like a different one is good enough that you would say they're not atheists well i mean are buddhists atheists are hindus atheists <laughs> who gets to define <laughs> do you see what i mean i mean the religions that have this personal god you know and you believe it or you don't yeah that, that very much you know that uh limits the issue right there to the point where you can't answer the question right yeah i got you that makes sense yeah you especially you you're right you're from trinidad yeah i am right so you don't sit there and point oh well those people are there the hindu temple they're the atheists and over here with the Muslim, <laughs> you know with the mosque they're the you know yeah. you do that yeah it it doesn't happen. That's how, that's how I just I was just asking, wondering if like people who, because I don't know where how people from like other other parts of the world think about it, you know. So I was just curious about it. Very good. Okay. So Philippe, come on, you got to say something. Ask a question. Talk. Everybody. 
Okay, Philippe, if you don't answer, I'm gonna mark you as only having been here half the day. Assuming you turned off your what? <laughs> okay. Um, Shah Shanaz, try to ask something, or what about in your country? Does your country allow for a lot of free speech? What would happen if somebody went out in the the square in front of the president's house or the Capitol and started asking powerful people questions. What country are you from? And tell me what would happen in your country. Uh, professor, I'm from Myanmar. And right now, um, <laughs> right now we are living in Bangladesh. So uh, because, uh, you know, in Myanmar, there's so much government problem with Rohingya and Myanmar uh, government. So um, as uh, we are being Rohingya, so it's so difficult to live in Myanmar because they are discriminated with Muslim and Burmese. So we have to leave the country. And right now we are living in Bangladesh and studying in Ayurveda. So, um, you know, um, there uh, in Myanmar, I still is having the problem with Rohingya. So uh, in in my community, uh, there is so, so much problem for the girls to study after the age of 15 or 16. And uh, in society now it's going child marriage. So, uh, you know, it's too difficult to study you know, in our religions because uh, the society does not allow us to study after the, the why you need to study what you will do after the studies they are questioning like this so uh, in that situation nobody is helping out but uh, uh, I'm got good luck that I don't follow the, them and I just I just do what I want and my parents my dad supported me and today I'm here that's great. I mean, uh, it's amazing. But but really, you could just say, when when the Buddhists in Myanmar, you know, say that the Rohingya Muslims are atheists, right, or they're corrupt, or they hate God, or they're not religious, or whatever, right? Hello, um, Hello ma'am. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, uh, so Shahana is saying that uh, it's very hard for her to study in the religion. So Shahana is a Muslim, right? Uh, yes. But but Islam never says that you will uh, study less or much. Uh, always Islam inspired to uh, study higher. But your community is not allowing. Yes, uh, it's yes. a problem with your community. Yes. Yeah, yes. It's, you're right. It's coming. It's depend with our community, oh, yes. especially we yes. are living in the rural area so like the people for example they are not seen ma'am it's not like that our community alone because after our graduation or something happened for example i graduated in the matter like the class 10 after that i don't have the nothing to do because we are not seeing any advantage if our communities see any advantage after our graduation like some job or opportunities something like you can do like other community other minority group of people are doing around the world they are not seeing those kind of anything for that they are not interesting for example you are complete did everything you have the degree and if you can't do anything why do you need those things those kind of mindset they are around is surrounding it depends the community it doesn't depend with our religion it's right. not like right so so if you ever had a chance to ask a religious leader who said, you know, God doesn't want women to get educated, right? Then if you were Socratic, you would say, well, how do you know that, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, of course I would say, and where did you find that? You have to show me the evidence. Right, and I've had students at AUW give long essays about how um, educated women, Muhammad, you know, respected women. He wanted them to be educated. He was way ahead of his time, you know, and then plenty of other Muslims say that, that Muhammad didn't want women, right? And so they disagree in the name of God. Does that make sense to all of you? 
Thanks, Professor. That was. So I had a, go ahead. I had another question. Um, I don't. So I don't know how to ask it though. Like, so is it because I don't know about the the religion that closely? So is it like for Muslim in the religion? Do they believe like that women should not be educated? Or something is that what the leaders tried to like the message they tried to put over? So I don't. Uh, can you please repeat the question again? Like so, like the leaders, like in the religion, like if you're a Muslim, is do the message they try to like put over, like the message they try to to how you say portray? Is it like women should not be educated or something? Is no, that what no, they no, think? No, no, not at all. Not no, at all. It, it did, you can be, you say you, anything you, by religion. So, 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 so our uh, prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam says, if you should go to China, then you will go to China for education. Uh, I got you. I understand. Do, but do all Muslims agree on that, or do Muslims disagree among themselves? Well, what does the Taliban think? So as a Muslim, yet I don't have clear definition about Taliban. So. <laughs> right. But you do, I mean, you do know that Muslims disagree about educated women, correct? Yes, Professor. Actually, we came here like we came in Bangladesh for our study and some people are telling to our parents like again, yeah, yeah. Why do you send your daughter to other, other country because it's not good? Like those kind of things they are telling, but my people, like my parents, they said, I have full confidence with my daughter. So it's her life he can do. Like it's important because they know the value of the education. But it's like depend like the people's and their mindset. Still they can some negative around being like this. <laughs> Right. Who who even, else? Go ahead. Even some of my relatives, they are saying to mom that your daughter is in other religion. She is going to Christian. Why you you send her to other country? Oh my God, like this. You have to, she have to marry now in this age. <laughs> like this, they are saying. But my mom refused. Whatever she is doing, it, it's... It's her decision, it's not our decision now. She's adult, she can do whatever she wants. Good. Okay, Poonam, what about you? Um, Professor, I just joined, I, I had internet issues, so I just joined, I don't know what, what to do. Okay, okay. About. So actually the issue here is whether religious leaders disagree about various things, but the obvious one is educating women. Do people in the name of religion disagree about whether you should be in college? Maybe she's lost her juice again. Um, all right, so. Let's go, let's go to um, the, what I promised last time, because the Lion students were um, the only ones in class because it was a holiday for Bangladesh, was um, we were gonna go over this thing about religious leaders. And I was gonna ask the AUW students like we're doing, do religious leaders disagree about various issues? Because in the United States, they do. They disagree about capital punishment. They disagree about um, prisons, the climate in a prison, should it be punitive or rehabilitative? They disagree about women, they disagree about gays, they disagree about um, the relation between church and state. They just disagree on a whole lot of things. Um, so I wanted to ask AUW students, do religious leaders disagree on things even in addition to um, 
women's education. That's one thing I think religious leaders, I mean, they disagree, that's all. Um, what about, is there another issue that you know that religious leaders disagree about? So uh, Islam always says you have to be, uh, we are, you have to be uh, lead a life with modesty. Okay. So as you can, yes, yes. But uh, maintaining all kind of modesty, you can uh, you can uh, go for higher education always, and you can go for jobs. But you have to maintain uh, modesty, or you, you have to be a good behavioral. That's that's that's. And also, uh, in in our daily life, if you don't follow any rules and regulation, what is the point of view? Then there will be chaos everywhere. No one is listening to anyone. So so you have to follow something which is ideal or a standard. So Islam says something like that. Okay, who else wants to talk about? Who else from AUW? <laughs> yes, Professor, I do agree with her because like it didn't say anything like you can study or it's like prohibited in by Islam or it didn't say anything like in Quran and Hadith because it's like you have the right you can study uh, by like by following all the Islam rules. For example, you should wear the hijab wherever you go, or you should wear the burqa. It's like those things you can. But in the community and the society, like there is some mullah and like the religions people who are giving like some guideline, but they are totally disagree with the like the girls study, especially in my area. In my area, I came from the rural area. So as far as I know, like, like they just like saying something, you can go out, like even you should like, if you wear burqa or if you can wear hijab, it doesn't matter. You are the Muslim, so you have to follow all the rule and you can study. It's like the people mindset, but in the Islam, it didn't say anything like girls can study or girls can go out like those things. Okay. Oh, yes, Shamima is right. Go ahead. Just everybody from AUW needs to, you know, say a few things here. Um, whatever Shamima says, the same problem is mine because we are from same country and same. Community. Well, let me say in Myanmar, when the politicians talk, do they ever condemn Islam as a religion? Do they say that they, they have to kick the Rohingya out because they need to have it be a Buddhist country because that's a more pure country or something? Do no, they... Professor, it's not related with the... Re... Hello, can you hear me, Professor? Yep. I can hear you. So the politicians never refer to religion. Hello, Professor, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, Professor, it's not like the, the government kicked out the, all the Rohingya to the Bangladesh. It's not because of the religion. Like in the behind, like there is a lot of the, like a lot of the problem, like the people we want, like all, because for being the Myanmar, like, for example, in your country, you have all the right. For example, you have the passport and you have the everything and you have the right. You can do whatever you want. For example, you can go easily to your, like the college and university. For being we Muslim, like I mean the we Rohingya, we don't have the anything. Even we don't have the, like the national ID card still. It's like I'm running like not 20 years old, but right now still I don't have the national ID card. Even for example, after graduating my from my school, then I can go like in my in my life I had the big dream to go to, to attend the university, but I like I graduated in 2016. After that, I just stay in home. I didn't get any opportunity to go to the college because for being Rohingya, we don't have the nothing to do like other the Buddhist minority group people are doing in front of us. It's like totally discriminating with us. Like, 
but like we can those kind of thing is not because of the religions they are like in our ancestry they are trying to get the name of the rohanja because if we had the name of the rohanja still they are like ignoring those names they are not calling they are calling us the bangli so they just send they just give our like to the bangladesh and because we want that name if we had the that name then we have all the right all the human rights because we don't have any freedom for example like for example i was i born in Myanmar, so still my parents they don't have any national id card also like my grandparents has because they were other countries they came to the Myanmar, in Myanmar. I mean the Yangon, which is the capital city of the Myanmar. So they came from there, they had the, like the national ID card, but still my parents, they don't have, for that we are trying to get our, like our human right, our fundamental right. When we like, we just asking like from our government, they just ignoring, we are not the, we are not the people. Uh, we should come like in Bangladesh because we are the Bangli, like those kind of things is happen because uh, it's not related with the Muslim and Buddhist. Okay, so I, I just am curious to know if politicians ever use religion to justify what really is about power, right? And so I, you know, if everyone in Myanmar knows this is just about power, <laughs> yeah, it depends also is power because uh, they have the power, they can do whatever we want because we don't have the nothing, they just doing it like they just trading with us like animals. Okay, I just I don't believe that the people, you know, the Buddhists think that, right? They don't walk around saying, Yeah, we treat them like animals and that's great, right? They they usually have reasons. That's all I'm trying to say is that they they usually frame it in terms of some kind of virtue, some kind of justification. They Politicians don't say, yeah, we get to treat these people like animals and it's great. And we're just going to keep it up. You know, <laughs> They don't say that. And most people don't believe that they are wicked. They basically have some justification for what they do. So that's all I was trying to get at. Um, Anyway, so so let me ask you another question, though. Let me just go to go yes, ahead. Can I question. Go ahead. Can I ask you a question? Yes. So, what is the Buddhist view towards other religion? Can anyone uh, answer here? Well, in general, it tends to be pretty tolerant, but that's why I've always wondered what the people, the leaders in Myanmar, right? how they they create this set of ideas to justify what they're doing i've always really wondered that and it's i don't i think it's really hard to find that in american news because all we get is what they're doing to the people they don't report what are they telling their own people about what they're doing right does that make sense yes, ma'am yeah buddhism in general isn't that way. Um, I mean, I know it's about power and money and all that, but I don't see how politicians don't say that. They always talk about the good. They always talk about virtue, justice, God, and truth, you know? <laughs> and so I was just wondering what, what they say. Um, all right, so let's try another tactic here and see if people can understand. Um, did I can't remember if we went over this. I don't think so. Does everybody remember the tsunami in Indonesia, the really big one? Um, it doesn't matter. Let's just pick out, there, there was a huge mudslide right in Myanmar. And there, there are these huge climate catastrophes, and now we're having more and more of them, right? Now, when they happen, what do people say, right? So after the tsunami in um, the US, 
there were a number of editorials uh, at, in the New York Times, right? And one of them said, where was God, right? How did God allow this to happen? Do people talk like that? That's what I want to know. When you talk to, when some disaster happens, when all these innocent people die, how do people resolve that? The people around you. So one way is where was God? And this particular author said, you know, that God either caused it to happen or allowed it to happen, didn't prevent it. And we don't know, you know, we shouldn't answer that. Um, and he quotes from the book of Job. It's not for us to answer those questions. We just accept them. Then the next article was about, um, it says thousands of lives could be saved if we had just um, put in some technology that we had. We had all the technology during the Clinton administration, but we didn't vote to pay 25 cents of taxes to put it in place so that those people would have been warned, right? And so this guy's mad that he thinks we ought to use our minds, right? Now he might be a religious humanist or a secular humanist, but he thinks we're supposed to develop these technologies. We're supposed to prevent we, we can't prevent the tsunami, but we can tell people to get the heck out of there so human lives aren't lost. So he gets mad about that. Um, let's see. Okay, so he's just saying, I was among a group of people that developed this and then it wasn't put into place and then the tsunami happens. And so he's pretty annoyed by that. Then the next one, is about waterborne diseases. So after the tsunami, a lot of people could have died of cholera and all sorts of other effects of having all this water and this disruption. And he's saying the reason it didn't happen was because people used their minds to set up um, to address those issues. So here's a case where the people use their minds and it did prevent a whole lot of additional suffering. Um, and then the last one is about uh, how much money Americans donate to um, these kinds of projects as opposed to people from other countries, okay? So then it's talking about to what extent is um, the reason things happen is that we have the technology but we're not willing to set up a system where it can be distributed equally. Right, so, um, okay, so then, yeah. The question is, when something like this happens, some people say it's God's will, right? Some people say whatever, you know, that good will come out of it. Some people say, no, there's no God, it's just human beings. So I just made up a list of what, 12 different possibilities. So I'm gonna read them, but I want each one of you to say the number of the one you agree with the most, or if there's more than one, or if you have a number 13, you have another one. Right? I want you to clock in. You have to vote or you have to speak. Each one of you has to speak about which one of these views you like the best or, or maybe also the worst, <laughs> whatever. But so people are trying to make sense of these huge disasters that kill many innocent people, right? Does somebody say, oh, it's God's way to control the population. We shouldn't do anything. Or people died innocently, so they'll go to heaven if they're Christians and they're not, they haven't sinned. So we should rejoice for their happiness. People died innocently. So if they, if they aren't, don't have any other sins and if they haven't been exposed to Christianity, right? but they haven't rejected it, then they'll go to heaven. 
okay, this was mostly, I mean, I, this was Lion students when I wrote it, right? You can fill in the gap, Islam, Buddha, Hindu, whatever, fill it in with your own religion. The children will all go to heaven. And so we should rejoice. Okay. People who died innocently go to heaven and people who gave aid to help these people will also go to heaven. So the tsunami led to a whole lot of people going to heaven. All right. So how about this one? God created a world where tidal waves exist, but there's no necessity for people to be living where they would be killed. The death was an accident. It wasn't God's will. So there's some things that happened that we couldn't predict. That was just an accident. Okay, what about the one where um, we could have had the technology, right? And we didn't use it. But anyway, number five is it was just an accident. God created a world where earthquakes and tidal waves happen. Um, it's not God's will that people happen to be living there and get killed, right? But we do have an obligation to help. Okay, now we got the atheists. There's no God. Accidents happen. We don't have to do anything. It's just an accident. There is no God. <clears throat> but we know the world is overpopulated, and this will help solve the problem. There's no God. But the purpose of life is to help our fellow creatures. We should give because it's human and humane. Stinginess is mean-spirited and it's a corrupted humanity. Okay, there's no God. The human mind is capable of generosity and of also devising machines to measure changes which would prevent future disasters or prevent human beings from being killed by these disasters. We should develop those machines and use our reason to help other people. God created the natural world and created us as rational creatures. Our faith tells us we should empathize with others and we should use our reason to improve the condition of other people. We should use reason to improve the human condition for the glory of God. Okay. Now, the other thing is we should use our reason just because it's human. That's the secular humanist, right? That's the human thing to do. Now, whatever view you take, if you identify with being a Christian or a Muslim or whatever, you'll have other people identified with Christian or Muslim who disagree with you, and you'll have other atheists who agree with you, right? The same is true of atheists. You'll have some Christians or Muslims who agree with you and some atheists who disagree with you. So now look those over. And when, you, when I ask you which one did you agree with, don't just say number four, try to describe it. Each one of you has to come up with your opinion. I want, you know, these are, designed to incite you, right? To make you angry or to get you to think, right? So each one of you, I want you to say, just, you know, as a reaction to all that list, what do you think? Okay, Haley, what do you think? Um, I kind of agreed with six and 11 um, because I don't necessarily think it's God's will for all those people to die, but these things do happen. But we should have empathy and help those around us when these things do happen and show love and kindness. What about developing technology? Yeah, that as well. Okay, because I mean, there's people who say we should clean up afterwards, but they're not, you know, high science people, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, there's a way to prevent these or to know when these things are going to happen so we can move people, then we should do that. Okay, that's using our minds, right? Right. Now, do you think that's God gave us minds we're supposed to use them, or do you think that's just human? I think God gave us minds to use them. 
Okay. Now that's that's the Liberal Arts Foundation. Did you know that when you came to Lyon? No. <laughs> yeah, nobody knows it, but that is the foundation. Does it make sense to you that the Union of Reason and Faith is mm -hmm. was the reason why our founders set these schools up? Um, okay. Uh, what about you, Samantha? I pretty much agree with number 11. I think that God gave us the ability to use our minds and to use uh, the things that we were gifted in to basically stop or alert of these natural disasters taking place. And so since we have this technology and we have the ability to think through these processes and build this technology, humans should use that to their advantage. Okay. So you think in the union of reason and faith? Yes. Okay. What about you, Aiden? Um, I'd agree with, can you hear me? Can y'all hear me or no? Well, it's a little muffled, so speak up. Is that better at all or? It's kind of, it's okay. Okay, so um, I agree with number six, um, just because a lot of the other ones are saying that God um, is like wanting to hurt people, which I don't think is true. And then I also don't think um, he's like sending tsunamis to kill people. I think it's a natural thing that just happens. It's part of the earth. Um, so I think to blame God for that is just false. And I think it's just wrong. Um, Okay. And then um, as not even just as Christians, but just as being a good person, I think you're obligated to help. Um, like with all these, these are focused on Christianity, but pretty much with all religions, I feel like um, you should just have the obligation to help others if you can. What about developing technology? Is that arrogance? Is that overstepping our bounds? Yeah. Are we just technology? To... I, I mean, I'm a science guy. I, technology should always be improving, and I mean, God, I think would want us to improve. That's okay, why we that's have. the thing, right? I mean, there are religious people that really think trying to use science and engineering is playing God, right? I mean, not yeah. I'm sure you're probably. Well, obviously you're right. There are people that think like that, but I just disagree with them. Okay. Um, okay, good. Uh, Destiny. I think I probably agree most with um, number 10. I don't necessarily believe that there is no divine power, but um, you have, to, you have to paraphrase it. I can't, none of us memorized. Um, number 10, there is no God. The human mind is capable of generosity and also devising machines to measure changes in the earth, which would prevent future disasters of this type. We human beings should develop those machines using our reason to help others is number 10. Okay. And I don't necessarily believe that there is no God but I don't believe that there's one perfect higher power. So I agree with that part. Um, and it's fundamentally part of my worldview that um, humans are essentially hotwired to help each other. Like we want to, it makes us happy. Um, it's good for us. It reinforces community ties and by um, creating a support system for our species as a whole, uh, we ensure our survival and flourishing. So I agree that we should use our reason to prevent disasters which would destroy us. What do you say if somebody um, thinks that secular humanists and science and technology is prideful, is overstepping our bounds, is arrogant. I say I don't care. <laughs> um, I don't really, why does it matter? 
Um, well, it matters because they vote and it matters because they're affecting the, you know, the country's direction. I wasn't done. Um, I oh, was saying, sorry. I was saying, uh, why would it matter whether or not we're um, morally overstepping bounds if oh. the cost of not doing that is uh, human life, happiness, um, and it generally our own survival. Um, does at the point where morality supersedes life, you have to consider whether morality, your version of morality, is actually serving you or if you're serving something else. Okay. Well, the thing about the voting is how to talk to people, right? Because everybody understands they have good reasons for voting the way they do. Um, but that's why it's humbling to me because I don't, I haven't figured out how to, how to, you know, even envision the, the country going in a direction where reason and faith would be united. Um, and so, you know, it's just, it makes me sad because I can understand how people vote and why they vote the way they vote. Um, so I didn't mean to be intolerant. I just, I just really get confused actually. Um, so Giovanni, which one of those do you think? Can I see the uh, the list again? <laughs> okay. Sorry. Um, well, let's, okay. So. All right, yeah. It was, um for me, it was, I kind of stuck with five and six. Okay. Because like, I didn't, I don't think like, I don't think God would like purposely hurt anybody, you know? Okay. And how I how I how I view it and how I believe it is like I think like earthquakes, tsunamis, you name it, all those type of things. I think it's all like like natural. Cause like, yes, I do believe in God, but I do also believe in science as well, you know, to an extent. So like you 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 get to a certain point where you understand like stuff happen naturally you know like disasters happen like if the temperature is a certain if it exceeds certain numbers then a forest fire might happen you know that's another disaster like stuff happens like a volcano can erupt all these things happen in life you know but like i don't believe like god would be using stuff like that as like a weapon to hurt anybody purposely and i don't believe like i mean i don't think any i don't know for a fact but i don't think any other religion whether it's hindu muslim anything in the world would believe that their their respective gods or what they believe in would be like using using tidal waves and stuff to hurt people you know or purposely kill them so yeah that's where i was kind of thought about it okay um okay what about philippe is it Felipe? Felipe, yeah. No, are you there? Okay, what about Nahida? I brief, I don't it's know. Okay, Felipe, okay. Do you have a view, Felipe? A view? Did you pick pick something? Do you have a opinion on that? I have an opinion, but in Spanish, <laughs> I don't know what I'm gonna say in English. Maybe. Okay, Nahida, what about you? Um, yes, Professor. Uh, so I have uh, created 
logic for both sides, Islam and uh, science. Uh, apart from that, uh, I am disagree, a strong, not only disagree, I strongly disagree with one and seven, because uh, an atheist can say that there is no God, but they can't say, they can't say that one and seven, yes, we have do nothing. It's completely wrong. For example, uh, after the uh, after the tsunami, we have realized that uh, tsunami. Uh, what we are uh, it, it's uh, reminding us about natural disaster, and it's it's uh, reminding us about our laggy lackness. What we are lagging behind? Why? And what resource should we prepare to overcome these challenges? And. Uh, Again, uh, I agree, I really agree with 11 and 15. So we should improve our condition. We should use the reason to uh, improve our this condition. And God gives us chance through this kind of uh, accidents. So okay. I really believe that. Okay, okay. Uh, yes, me too, I may agree with Nahida. Go ahead, keep talking. You think God wants us to use our brains? Ah, uh, yes. To help help each other to prevent problems, right? So, Shanaz, do you think everybody you know agrees with that? Do you think? Um, do you know people who have a fundamentally different view of things? Sorry, Professor. Do you do you does do you think everyone would agree to that? Uh, yes, I I don't think different people have different opinion, but my opinion is what Nahida says. That's correct. Okay. Um, how about Shamima? Yes, Professor. I like totally disagree with seven and ten because it says like in seven it said there is no god it's like accident happened wouldn't have to do anything so i totally disagree with that because we believe like god as well also we believe the science so and in the 11 i was agree with that because it say god create the nature what yeah it's true because we believe what about we this happened, we believe the God, and also we have the faith in, on God. Okay. Okay, God created the world and we're supposed to use our reason to understand it, is that? Yeah, we are like, we have to, yeah. Okay. Did you, were you aware that you already thought this long before this class? You figured the, all that stuff out? Sorry, Professor. Did you know what you thought? I mean, was there a certain point in high school or something where you decided that's what you thought? Is it not like that? <laughs> okay. Um, Nimra, what about you? <laughs> Jamie? Yes, Professor, uh, I do agree with uh, Nahida. Okay, go ahead, just elaborate. Just say it in your own words. Okay. Okay. Jamie, you got something? No. Poonam? Uh, yes, Professor. So uh, I'm disagree with number six. Like uh, it says, go trade the world, and there was earthquake, and then so go. Uh, like I have read somewhere, like no one wants to uh, destroy their own creation. So it's not for the. It's naturally happens. So there is no, no like. God is not related to it because God created the world, so God don't want to destroy his own creation. Okay, all right. So now in the last um, 
What do I have? Another 15 minutes? Okay, let me go back and talk a little bit more about Socrates in Athens. Um, that was, so this one was related to his conversation with the religious leader, right? And so it is important to know that religious leaders disagree and they believe lots of very different things and they refer to God to explain and justify a lot of things. But let's go back to Socrates talking about his life, okay? So um, the, earlier I talked about, I was Plato and I grew up in Athens, but now I'll just talk like Socrates for a minute. Okay, so I was a stone cutter, right? I was just a, an ordinary citizen. I was, not, I was the middle class, I was not one of the privileged class. Even though we, we were supposedly a democracy, so, you know, people cho were chosen by lot to be in the assembly and the, um, the juries. Of course, it was Greek males with a certain amount of property, but that was still much broader than it had been before. But if you were like me, uh, you know, with the minimal amount of property, I qualified, but I wasn't in the upper echelon. Um, there, there was a, there was just a continuing of certain families that kept getting all the privilege and the education. But that's okay. I was just a citizen, and I was doing what I thought the city was structured for us to do. Like if we qualify we have to be informed. So what I did is I used to go up to the Agora, right? I used to go to the marketplace. Um, I, in honor, I wanted to honor Athena, the goddess of justice. And I was at the court, you know, defending myself. And I knew that what was going on in the system was that um, sophists, people from foreigners from other city states came and they taught the children of the best and brightest, the future leaders, how to be persuasive in court, how to appeal to emotions, how to appeal to flattery, how to appeal to prejudices, how to appeal to all sorts of irrational um, motivations for voting. Whereas the system was set up for you to disengage, right? Somebody is guilty or not based on the facts, the laws and the evidence and the situation. And you're supposed to be able to think like a citizen and not be motivated by emotion or prejudice. You're supposed to be able to grow up, right? treat other people as equals under the law, right? And so um, I knew that the system had been corrupted, but what I did is if I was accused of corrupting the youth and not believing the gods, the only thing to do is to explain my way of life, right? So I explained my way of life. And I think I was the best citizen for a democracy. And I thought, our founders set that up. I thought the stories of the gods are always telling us they've given us these gifts of justice and reason. We're supposed to use them. We're supposed to govern ourselves. And that's how we respect the gods. But I knew, you know, it wasn't going to work out. It just, what happened is after we beat the Persians and we started in the war against the Spartans, Every year, it seemed, things were getting worse and worse. Like it, we were becoming more and more empire building. The, the courts were getting more and more corrupted. People were more and more driven by emotion. They were getting more polarized. The rich were getting richer. The poor were getting poorer. The middle class was shrinking. Um, people were becoming more afraid, less trusting of each other. So, you know, the purpose of tragedies is to flush out those irrational emotions. People were not learning those lessons when they went there. Um, so I would go to the marketplace 
And I would ask military leaders, you know, it's a perfectly reasonable question. What is courage? Like, how do you know a good general or a good soldier? And um, so I asked one of the generals who'd been promoted because he had been a really tough guy, boots on the ground guy, right? Lakeys. And I said, well, what is courage? And he said, courage is standing by your post and doing what you're told. Well, the trouble is that's courage in, in an authoritarian society too, right? That, that doesn't, that's the same. So you're giving an answer that would, would fit much better in an authoritarian society than in Athens society. Um, so are soldiers supposed to, obviously in the heat of battle, they have to do what they have to do, but can soldiers question outside of, right? When they're back home, can they start asking questions and ask, what is this war about? Or are we, are we conducting this campaign in a way that's a lot more brutal than it needs to be, right? So in a democracy, soldiers should be able when they're off duty to examine what's going on and to publicly, you know, question. Um, that shouldn't be unpatriotic. That's the way to prevent a society from worshiping military and not questioning. And then I asked, um, I asked the artists, right? What is beauty? What is art? And all they could tell me, like Ion was reciting Homer to the public and he had a great reputation for reciting Homer. And I liked Homer because I thought Homer was about getting over pride and greed and um, power lust. And it has all these characters who are infected by these diseases, pleasure, wealth, glory, and power. And so Homer is speaking like these people and then they're falling apart, right? They're, they're destroying themselves, they're destroying their families, they're destroying their societies. So I like Tomer. He's telling you, don't do this. You'll be tempted to do this. Don't do this. But Ion, I asked him, Ion, I'm so jealous of you. You get to recite this stuff to people. What do you think Homer is saying? Ion didn't have any clue of what Homer's mission, you know, Homer's message was, the education. All he knew was he loved the iambic pentameter of Homer. He loved the sound of it. He loved reciting it. He, it made him feel good. And so he also loved dressing up and performing. And he, he won first prize, right? People loved his performances. And so he said, you know, when I go there and I perform and people are crying, you know, cause I've got them identifying with Achilles or whatever, then I'm laughing because I know I'm gonna make a lot of money. But if someday I go and I'm sort of off my game and I'm trying to elicit this pity and fear and they're just, you know, indifferent or laughing, then I'm crying because I know I didn't pull it off. So all Ian was talking about was himself as a performer. And that was what he was proud of. He could manipulate people. And then he wanted to be appointed to be a general, right? Because he can manipulate people. He could inspire people to go to war, but he didn't have any interest in trying to encourage people to question who's, who's running this war? What are the motives behind this war? All he cared about was his ability to persuade and to manipulate. So that was, that was how Homer was being recited. Then you had um, the craftsmen, the people who could make shoes. They could make just fine shoes and that's great. It's just that when you ask them, what is justice? They had all these opinions about what you know, should be done over here and over there. And they, they had no knowledge, right? They had no expertise. 
they didn't bother to ask the experts. It's like they thought because they were a good shoemaker and because they had a chance to vote in the assembly that they could vote however they wanted, however they felt. They didn't have to like get informed. They didn't have to go ask some of the leaders, well, what do you think justice is? What do you think we should do based on your experience? So there wasn't any common belief that you have to practice in order to become practically wise. You have to educate yourself. Like you have to go to the Agora and you have to look at the jury trials that are posted. You have to find out what's going on, what people are saying. You have to find out what decision was made. You have to follow up on it and find out, well, how did that work out? Did it turn out that the jury made a good decision or did they make a mistake? And then how do we learn from the mistake? And the same with the assembly, like you find out what they're voting on, you find out some history, develop some history. How did they vote? How did that turn out? So you literally have to educate yourself. You have to develop a memory. You have to develop a history. You have to look at the patterns. You have to think about, you know, 20 years ago, has Athens changed? Has it changed for the better? What's going on? You know, are the Spartans? What's with the Spartans? What's happening? What would be the best way for us to move forward and preserve stability within our, our city state and then maintain decent relationships outside of our city state? This is really difficult. Um, so the more people I asked, like the religious leaders like Euthyphro, he just found a quote in Homer to justify whatever he wanted. And so the more I did it, the more I worried, right? Because I don't, I can't find enough people who are really trying to make this effort that I'm trying to make, which is to really educate myself in citizenship. Um, and so far, <laughs> All I know is that I don't know, right? I know that I don't know what the cobbler, the shoemaker thinks he knows. I know that I don't agree with blind obedience to whatever wars whoever decides to get us into. I know I don't agree with um, reciting Homer in a way that gives you fame and fortune. I know, you know, <laughs> I, I know that I disagree with that, but my gosh, that hasn't taught me much of anything. And so, I mean, I do know that when it comes to these difficult way of educating yourself so you know how to vote in a, in a jury trial and in the assembly, that you actually make the right, you actually vote the right way. Like that is really hard. And you might, you know, you just have to keep working at it too because situations change. And so I, I think that the founders of Athens and, and all the men, the leaders who set up all these institutions were really wise because they all are telling you constantly, you've got to keep working on this. But the people who have inherited the, this tradition don't even know what they were supposed to do. They've corrupted it without even knowing <laughs> that they are corrupting it because they thought it was freedom. Freedom means the freedom to do whatever you want. You want to get rich? Sure, go ahead. Uh, wrap the city around your finger, get yourself rich. That's great. You want to be popular? Sure, go ahead. Wrap your you know, tell people whatever they want to hear, you'll be popular. It doesn't matter if you corrupt their judgment. It doesn't matter if you distract them. It doesn't matter if you make them incapable of thinking like a citizen. If you're successful, you know, you've used this, that's what the system is there for. You have the freedom to succeed however you want to define success. And so, and so I, you know, I started to really worry about the future of Athens. And I really did worry that it would 
fall apart, right? It become unstable. Nobody cares. And then some political, politically ambitious person would say, you vote for me and I'll bring us back to the good old days, right? When people obeyed their, we had family values, patriotism, and belief in, this, in the traditional gods. And that'll make us stable and that'll make us happy. But of course, that was the opposite of what the founders of Athens wanted. It was the opposite of what having all those, um, the, the deities in Greek myths and the symposia in private homes where you're supposed to talk. The tradition is about dialogue back and forth, listening to everyone, arguing for them, arguing against them, always linking reason and faith. And so we had lost our democracies spiritually in terms of our idea of the good and our ideas about justice and democracy died long before the city actually collapsed. Um, and so, so that's my story. And that's what I said in the apology. So for next time, um, I got right. I got considered guilty, and I even got um, the sentence of death. And so, for next time, you're going to read a dialogue where um, I'm sitting in prison, and my friend Crito comes the night before I'm going to be killed. And I knew my friend Crito. He was my patron. He was the rich guy who actually kept my family fed. Um, and it didn't surprise me when he came and it didn't surprise me when he, he wanted me to leave, but I wasn't going to leave. <laughs> and so we have this conversation where he, he gives his reasons for why I should escape because he's got it all arranged, no problem. And I give him my reasons for why I shouldn't escape. And so for next time, that's what we'll start with, right? Who do you agree with? Should Socrates have escaped or not? All right. Does anybody have questions? Does anybody anticipate what Socrates is going to say? <laughs> anyway, you can think about that. You should think about that before you read it. If somebody falsely accused me of something, what would I do? Right? And it happens. I guess to undergraduates, um, what if somebody truly falsely accuses you of rape? And I'll just assume that it's a girl that accuses a guy. It doesn't have to be, but let's assume. And her dad is a rich lawyer and you are going to lose. <laughs> what would you do? Haha, ha. I'm going to leave you with that. Okay. What would your friends do? Or if your friend did, if that happened to a friend of yours, what would you do? Okay. Think about it, guys. And I'll see you next, next, you know, it's five days from now. And you can put your posts up and all that stuff. Okay. Everybody. All right. See you, Liz. Bye, professor. Bye, professor. Bye-bye. Bye, Professor. I have a birthday again. Ah, uh, Professor. Yeah, just a sec. Let me stop yeah, the recording. Did you take the attendance? Are you 